Okay. Okay. Welcome back. I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, so, before the weekend, uh, we were talking about fields of fractions, and we showed that the fields, the field of fractions, we showed how to define it. We showed it's a field. We showed it contains the domain you start with. Um, and what I what what was left to prove was that it is somehow the smallest field uh, that contains your the domain. And that statement, what I mean by that statement is this theorem that I didn't have time to prove. Um, so if you if you have a domain and it's containing any field, then that containment, then what's containing that field is also the field of fractions, basically. Because if there's an injective homomorphism, from the field of fractions to this other field, we get we could pretty much say that the fr is the same as its image. So k contains fr, and it contains only one copy. It contains it in only one way because this homomorphism is unique. So uh, let's go prove it. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, question. Um, we have to prove that there's a homomorphism and that it's unique. So, I wonder if you've heard this before. Um, when you need to prove existence and uniqueness, what do you start with? Existence? No, sorry. Uh, you start with uniqueness. <clears throat> It kind of it would make sense to start with existence, but the thing is, um, if you if you prove uniqueness first, so many times that just gives you the answer for the existence, um, such as in this example. So you prove so you start by proving that if the thing exists, it's unique. You prove that there's a, a most one homomorphism. And that usually just gives you the answer for what that one homomorphism that exists is. So let's start with the uniqueness. This is a very useful thing to know for when you have to prove such a statement. <clears throat> so uh, I need to show that. Um, well, if he satisfies the two properties um, that I that I wish for, oh, I can't help. Why does it look different in both screens? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's two properties um, that it is the identity on the on the original ring, and that it's a homomorphism. Then phi is uniquely determined. So what you welcome. What should phi of a fraction be? So every element of uh, the field of fractions um, has this form. Um, and well, we we already answered that on on Friday. What you what you could do is think of now we know that fractions have all the properties um, you would want. So for example, I know that this fraction is a product of these two. I that's how I define the, the multiplication of fractions. But by virtue of phi being a homomorphism, the 
this is going to be v of a divided by one times v of one divided by b. Now, something I already know about the field of fractions is that one divided by b is the inverse of b divided by one. Um, and again, a homomorphism uh, is going to send a unit to a unit. Uh, sorry, an inverse to the, the inverse to the inverse. So, <clears throat> uh, phi of a divided by b, unsurprisingly, is phi of a times the inverse of phi of b. Now, by the second property, this has to be a times b inverse. So there's only there's only one answer. So this proves uniqueness. And as I just promised, the proof of uniqueness. What the hell? Every update make, makes this app more buggy. Oh my god. Oof. Okay. Um, as I promised, the proof of uniqueness just gave me a formula. So to prove existence now. I have most of my work done for me because I already have the answer. So existence means show that this formula is a homomorphism. Show that P of A divided by B equals A B inverse is uh, an injective homomorphism. More fism. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so let's prove existence. This is going to seem a little silly. Uh, it's not. It's easy, which is different. Um, so um, P of zero has to be zero. So, um, well, this is clear because zero is in the ring. Um, G of zero is, um, well, I said everything, everything in the fraction field is really, is really a fraction. I mean, the denominator is one, <clears throat> but this is zero times the inverse of one, which is of course zero. P of one is just exactly the same thing. We also get one. Now, uh, I need to show that phi preserves sums. So I need to show this is what I need to show. Um, So, okay. So, A, of course, um, A, A divided by B and C divided by D are elements in the fraction field. Um, so, how do I compute the left? How do I compute the left hand side? You would just add the fractions together how we established last week. Right, yeah, so um, so it's important, I mean, it's gonna seem very silly because we're just gonna do the same thing on both sides, but here we add the fractions together. Um, the reason for this is the definition of adding on, on the fraction field. 
now. So Roy gets the bonus point. The definition, no. By definition of C, this is the, uh, well, this is AD plus BC divided by BD. So hopefully on the right-hand side, we get the same answer. Should we start with the product? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so now we have to use first the definition of phi. The definition of phi says that this is a v inverse plus c d inverse. So, how am I going to show that that these two expressions that I just got are equal? You can multiply each term by one and then turn right. one into the product of inverses. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So um, you do what you, I mean, really, I, I'm allowed to write this like this, honestly. Uh, what you do is you do, you just use the properties of fields um, to make a common denominator. And get the answer, and then use the distributive law to get the same answer. So, of course, we get the same answer, but on one side, we define it to make sense on the other side we do we use properties that all rings have <laughs> but i think i mean the difficult part here is not adding fractions you all know how to add fractions the difficult part is knowing what we need to prove and what we need to use uh, at each turn um okay um so lastly we need to show the same thing for multiplication So I showed uh, that it preserves some. Well, okay, I'm not going to show it for multiplication. It's the same proof. On one side, we're going to use the properties of fields. On the other side, we're going to use the definition of multiplication in the fraction field. Okay, so this shows that phi is an isomorphism. <clears throat> it's a homomorphism, sorry. It's not an isomorphism. Any questions? Um, okay. Well, I would have to show, I guess another claim that I made is that P of A divided by one is A, but this is clear from the definition. And the last thing I wanna show is that phi is injective. So how do you show that a homomorphism is injective? Does it have to do with finding the zero in the kernel? Finding the kernel of a uh, um that ring. So what am I supposed to get for the kernel sensor? Like zero should be included. So then you will have all the elements as long as you can prove that zero is in there. Well, I mean zero is in the kernel. That just means that P of zero is zero. That happens for every homomorphism. So what else is in the kernel? Should be nothing, right? N nothing, right. Okay, you both get a bonus point, Duncan and... And sounds hard. You should show... Um, every time you wanna show that a homomorphism of rings or groups is injected, uh, you show that the kernel is zero. I mean, because... For a, normally for a random function to be injective, you would have to show that two different elements go to different things, but showing that the kernel is zero is just easier. <laughs> so, 
so now, so this is going to be, um, I mean, I could, I could just do it, but also I don't feel like it. I, am, I feel like taking the easy way out. So, so phi, so remember phi is a homomorphism from a field to another field. And probably you've seen this last semester, but I mean, what do we know about the kernel of any ring homomorphism? Um, it's not just any subset, right? It's a special kind of subset. Duncan? It's an ideal, right? So what does that mean? Um, what are the ideals of the field of fractions? What are the ideals of a field? Just zero to zero. Right. Uh, if any field has two ideals. So, so this is pretty easy because uh, I just want to show that one possibility is not true. The ideals of a field are zero and everything. And the kernel is not is not everything because phi of one is not zero, for example. So the kernel must be zero. And there you go. <clears throat> so um, I mean, I could have just done it, but a homomorphism from a field. Is, is either zero or it's injected because um, what I just said, the kernel is an ideal and there's two options for an ideal in a field. Either it's zero, so the map is injective or it's everything, so the map is zero. But a map that's zero has to send one to zero. And, and that can only happen if, if the target is the zero ring and the zero ring is not a field. I guess I should say one is not zero. Okay, any questions? All right, uh, so that's um, it's for fields of fractions for now. So now I'm going to talk about factorization in domains. So this section has a ton of different types of classifications of domains. Um, there's a lot of words. Basically, I want to I'm going to define all these things called unique factorization domain, principal ideal domain, Euclidean domain, an Ethereum ring, whatever. Uh, I don't know. I personally get a bit, I don't like memorizing words, but it's what it is. Anyway, the goal is to get uh, the composition factorization into primes, like you do in the integers, see which rings have that. Uh, so let me remind you some some words. Um, let R be an integral domain. Ooh. 
which words do I want to talk about? Um, so, if you have two elements, um, we say A divides B. And we write it with a bar. If there is some other element in the ring, such that B is A times C. Um, or, you know this, just reminding you. Um, we say A is a unit. If there exists uh, something, let's say C. Uh, if he has a multiplicative inverse, in other words, if it divides one, um, <clears throat> this word I think I haven't said before, but we say A and B are associates if if one is a product of the other by a unit. Oh, I should say the set of units we write are times. Okay, so um, okay, so if we if we look at two whole numbers. What does it mean for them to be associates? If they're the same number? Nope. I mean, if they're the same number, of course they're associates, but they could be associates without being the same number. They're both units? Uh, no. They're equal? I mean, yeah, yeah, like I said, if they're if they're equal, if they're the same number, then they're associates, but they could be associates without being the same number. If they're inverses of each other? Well, in the in the integers, the only numbers that have which numbers have inverses in Z? One and minus one. Okay. So um, so then, what numbers are the associates of four? Four and minus four. Right. Exactly. Uh, so two numbers are associates if they're if they're the same up to a sign. So if you know four minus four, four is negative one times four, which is a unit times. Um, A unit times its associate. Uh, and notice that A and B are associates if they divide each other. Let's say this is an exercise. <clears throat> um, so if you have two polynomials, um, and K is a field, um, 
when are two polynomials associates? Is it if the absolute value of the leading coefficients are the same? Uh, well, K is a field. Um, a lot of fields don't have absolute values, like the integer is not seven. So uh, I think you're onto something, but not quite. What are the units of, of the polynomial ring? Isn't it still one and minus one? No, there's more. There, there's more of those. Uh, there's more invertible elements in the polynomial ring. Is it if um, if they divide each other with a zero remainder? If they divide each other, right? That, I mean, that's true for any ring. So yes. Um, so what can I say about two polynomials that divide each other? Because there's there's a more um, explicit way to see that two polynomials divide each other. How could two polynomials divide each other? I mean, of course, if they're the same, but there's there's more ways in which they could. They have some factor in the polynomial ring that's uh, common? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, every factor is going to be common if they divide each other. Every factor, you know, P divides Q. So every factor of P is a factor of Q and Q divides P. So every factor of Q is a factor of P. But they're both, both reducible in the field. They don't have to be. Okay, so what's an example of two degree one polynomials that divide each other and they're not the same? Five X plus five and X plus one? Uh, yeah. So, um, so what is it about these two polynomials that make them divide each other? Notice that they're both irreducible. They're both degree one. Duncan. Is it being the same up to a constant multiple? Exactly. Um, if they divide each other, that means that their degrees have to be the same. So their quotient has to be degree zero, which is a constant. Um, so yes. Duncan, did you get a bonus point? Did you go? Uh, so some constant, of course, non-zero in the field, um, so two polynomials are associated if they're the same up to a constant, um, which is the reason why often we just like to look at monic polynomials because just divide by the lean coefficients and you only get two monic polynomials are associates only when they're the same. So um, this is a useful notion because a lot of the time, changing a number by its associate doesn't change anything when you're talking about factorization. I know, I mean, over the integers, we like to talk, we think of just factoring positive numbers, but negative three is as much of a prime as three is. So, um, you know, both of these factorizations 
authorizations into primes. Oh, and now you're not thinking anymore. Of course you're not thinking. Why would you? <sighs> okay. Um, this wasn't happening last semester. The, the Google just said, let's make a software update that ruins the app. Anyway, 15 is three times five, but it's also negative three times negative five. And I, I still want to claim that factorization is in the integers is unique. So what I have to say is that it's unique up to associates, up to sticking a bunch of negative signs in front of, in front of primes. Likewise, a polynomial, we're about to see that um, factors in a unique way into reducible polynomials. And this is, well, you could always, if you have, you know, x plus one times x minus two, you could always multiply those by constants in a way that cancel out. And I still want to say that factorization is unique, um, which is why what I have to say is that it's unique up to taking associates. And now we're stuck here. Oh, now it's thinking whatever I wrote five minutes ago. All right. Great, awesome. Um, okay, so basically, associates, of course, are not the same number, but often we can just think that they're basically the same. Three and negative three for are often uh, are just the same thing. Uh, okay, so if I want to talk about factoring into stuff, that can be factored like prime numbers. I need to, I should also define what that stuff is. Um, we say A is irreducible. If, um, if it can't be factored. But of course, every number can be factored. Three can be factored, it's three times one, and it's negative three times negative one. Uh, but the thing is, the only, those two factorizations are pretty silly. Um, because one of the factors is a unit, and that is something I can always do. So if you can't do it non-trivially, then I say the, the element of the ring is irreducible. Likewise, any polynomial you can factor, it's just two times one half of it. But if you you wanna you you want what you care about is can you factor it as as polynomials of positive degree? So this is irreducible. And now um, now I'm gonna tell you what prime is, and prime is not the same as irreducible. Prime means that if it divides the product of numbers, then uh, it divides one of them. So, um, for example, prime numbers are prime, which is Good because otherwise we shouldn't call this prime. If um if a prime number divides a product of two numbers, it must divide one of them. Uh, that's not true for non-prime numbers. Um, six can divide a product of two numbers and not divide either. Um, we'll see. Irreducible polynomials are also prime. <clears throat> However, um, there's a reason that these are different notions um, that not every um, not every irreducible element is prime. Uh, 
Um, and I'm showing you how this goes wrong uh, before, but let me show you again. Uh, let's just pick. So the book goes with with this ring. Uh, the integers together with root of negative three. So first of all, this is a ring. Um, when you multiply, clearly when you add things together, you stay in the ring, but when you multiply, you also stay in the ring. So the thing is, um, in here, two, the number two, it's irreducible, but not prime. And um, well, Let's see. Um, Wait, two isn't prime? Two is not prime. You heard correctly. Um, so let's start by showing that two is irreducible. Of course, over the integers, you know that two can't be factored. F, um, I'm just going to write root negative three. Uh, as a product of whole numbers, but now I have more numbers to choose from. Like maybe, you know, uh, one of these uh, allows me to factor it too. Uh, but the answer is no. So what you do here, the, the trick is to use the absolute value. Um, so if you take Uh, actually, the absolute value is squared. I'm going to call this number new. Um, so, as you know, um, the absolute value, the the modulus of a of a complex number is the square, the root of the square of its real and imaginary parts, which is the root of a squared plus three b squared. So with square, it's just that without the square root, um, which is a whole number, of course, because a and b are whole numbers, even a positive whole number because um, it's the sum of squares. <clears throat> So, um, for any complex number, when you multiply, when you multiply the, the modulus multiplies as well. Uh, you might have seen this. Okay, let, let's just prove it. Um, So if I multiply and then take the length, uh, multiplying, you, well, you foil, I guess. And you remember that I squared is negative one. And then this is the square root of the real part plus the imaginary part 
Uh, and now you cleverly factor this. So you uh, you do use the binomial theorem. You write out the squares of a squared c squared plus b squared b squared minus the double product, which is a b c d. And now you get really lucky, these numbers cancel. And now we stare at this for a second. And what do you see here? Isn't it just uh, a squared plus b squared in parentheses and then times uh, c squared plus d squared in parentheses? Yep, exactly. Um, good eyesight. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you already got a bonus point, but let me write it down in case you didn't. Um, so yeah, I mean, also that's what I promised you would get. So now these are all positive numbers. So I can distribute over the square root and there you go. Um, magic. <clears throat> okay, so that's true for all complex numbers. So it's true for, for these, uh, this subring that I was talking about. So now back to two equals uh, trying to factor two. This would mean that the absolute value of two so the, the square so new remember I'm I'm using for the the square of the absolute value. So the square of the absolute value of two is of course four and here I get a plus three b squared times c squared plus three b squared. So these are all integers. <clears throat> so this is either one times one, uh, sorry, one times four or two times two. Um, because because I'm factoring the number four, and you know how the number four factors over the integers. So. Um, So what happens if a squared plus three b squared equals two and c squared plus three b squared equals two? What can you tell me about this equation where remember that these are all whole numbers. So an A and C are the same and B and D. And what what are they? What are what are A, B, C, and D? Well, 
what whole numbers a and b can you take so that a squared plus 3b squared is 2. I think you know the answer to this. Does anyone find a solution to this equation? Okay, so what do you know about squares of real numbers? What happens when you take a, a real number and you square it? You're multiplying itself by itself. And what, what do you get? A positive number. A positive number or zero if you start with zero. So um, if b if b is not zero, three b squared is at least three, um, and a squared is going to be positive. So these two together are going to be at least three. So b must be zero, and if b is zero a squared has to be two. And there's no whole number whose square is two. So this is not possible. Right? There's no there, there's no way to solve this equation. Basically, you try, you know, try to make a equals one, b equals zero, try to make zero zero. And once you make a bigger than two or b bigger than zero, the numbers are just too big. They can never be two. Um, just because you're always adding bigger numbers. So, so this is not possible. Um, if you have that, if we're in the other situation, are there any questions? Oh, come on here, oh no. Uh, right. Um, if you're in this situation, then this magic happens. You factor this. This is a, a difference of squares. 3b squared is negative the square of 3ib. So it factors um, in this way as the sum times the difference. So a plus root negative three b is a unit. In conclusion, two is irreducible because I showed all the possible ways in which you can factor and in all of these, which are all like this, um, the numbers are a unit also. I mean, you could solve this equation, see that a has to be plus or minus one and b has to be zero. Okay, so two is irresistible. Um, tomorrow, I'll show that two is not prime. Okay, that's it. Uh, so I should remind you, I posted 